Well, hola, buenas tardes a todos. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our presentation. Allow me to introduce my colleague Sara Rodriguez and myself, Santiago Moreno. We are working at MinSight as a data scientist. And uh, during the last years, we have had the opportunity to work in many, many fields related with data scientists. Okay? And now we are bringing to you, we are going to share with you a project we have been working, in this case related to a particular field, that is the, the satellite images and the uh, discovery of water using satellite images. Okay, so I was saying before, uh, we are working at MinSight. MinSight is an intra company that helps our clients to, to go with them during the digital, digital transformation pro process. And as I'm sure most of you know, Indra is one of the biggest consulting groups in Spain. Okay. So we have a lot of people, many colleagues that are very expertise on their fields and have a lot of knowledge in many, many different fields, like for example, uh, energy, industry, uh, security, healthcare, and particular, for example, here in Earth observation. And uh, thanks to that, is one of the reasons because we have had this opportunity during the last years of working in a very, very different fields. Almost any field you can imagine in that our our world, the data scientists, have applications. So, inside Minsight, we belong to the unit of data scientists and artificial intelligence. That is the result of combining uh, three different competences you have here depicted in the slide, artificial intelligence, data engineer and visualization, and data science, that's the, where Sarah and I belong. Okay? And we're trying to join all of them in order to help our clients and give to them the best answer as possible. As you can see here, uh, our unit is composed for, from uh, very, very different profiles. In fact, you can think that uh, that we are a very heterogeneous group of people because we are, we really are. We are people, people who are coming from engineers, we have engineering, marketing people, statisticians, linguists, but we all share some things in common, many things in common, particularly that we really want to always to try to get all the information as possible as the data is trying to give to us and try to go beyond just the evidence, okay? So, after this brief inter introduction of ourselves, our company, and our unit, let's focus in the project we want to share with you, okay? This project is the Land Analytic Earth Observation Platform. You can see here, it's a project for the European Space Agency. We have been working in this project during 2017, so the, the last year. The project is, the platform is finished, and in fact, in the last month of July, July 2018, uh, the, the, we, we have the final report with people from the European Space Agency, and there they acknowledge that effectively all the requirements that we have to reach were, were met. Okay, so uh, we are going to go deeper in this, but I want you to have uh, just at the beginning what all of this is about. The idea is just to take the information coming from the satellites as raw data. We are going to process it, and at the end, we are going to provide a result that implies that we have discovered water at a pixel level. Or we are going to classify pixels with water and non-water. And we are going even a step ago, we are going to, to try to group all these uh, pixels and study water bodies and their evolution in time. The first thing we are going to show you is the tools we have used we have worked with in this project. Here we have uh, an image of the architecture of our IoT and big data platform called Sophia2. Uh, in this platform, we have developed all the analytical part of our project. Here we, uh, you can see there are the different modules that all together make the platform. You can see highlighted the models we have used during this project, particularly the data flow that we have used it to capture, to ingest in our staging area and a Hadoop cluster, all the information that was provided by the satellites. We'll see later, we have, uh, before this, we are going to go deeper in this, uh, another subsystem, the processing subsystem, we'll explain it later. And finally, all the information, we have treated it using the Sophia 2 notebooks, 
we have used uh, Apache Zeppelin and working with Spark. Most of the coding was written in Scala and some part of it also in, in Python by Spark. Sophia2 is a platform that is born in, in the context of the inter Internet of Things and it has been evolving, evolving since, this, since then. In fact, uh, in, the la in, the in the last months, uh, so there has been a rebranding of Sophia2 and now a new platform called OneSide is the evolution of Sophia, of Sophia2. Uh, why is that? Well, the reason is because Experian has shown us that, uh, well, it's pretty obvious, but mm, well, anyway, uh, it's important uh, that uh, experience has shown us that um, we live in a world of uh, constant change, so you have to adapt to it as fast as possible. So the idea you have to keep in mind is to be agile and to be flexible. Uh, how do you work in a world like this? Okay, you have to go to collaborative models, okay? Try to shift towards service models, uh, based on mostly cloud strategies, and with uh, uh, you are going to have to to deal with a high penetration of open source models. Okay, so as you can see, uh, this is a very complex world with very complex scenarios based basically in a hyper connectivity. You are going to go probably many many times in a big data scenario, and of course new requirements of server security you are going to take into account. So this is uh, the philosophy that one side applies in order to answer to all the necessities and problematics we, we have seen in the, in the previous slide. So our philosophy is, ba is based in these three steps. The first of all, the think big, start small strategy, tries to give us the possibility to be, to be agile and to be flexible. Uh, the platform is totally composed of uh, open source technology. Uh, all the tools that compose it are open source. In fact, in, uh, in a few months, I don't, know, I don't have the number exactly, but in a few months, uh, the platform itself is going to be open source. And finally, uh, we combine it with a vast experience because in Minsight is a, is a reference in the service security world. And uh, we don't have to forget that the one main side, the one side platform is an evolution of Sophia 2 that has been on top of the game of the build data game of the big data world since since the beginning. Okay, after talking about the tools, uh, let's go to uh, put into context our project. Huh? Mm, so uh, the, our platform, Land Analytics Earth Observation Platform, uh, we have developed it in collaboration with our uh, our colleagues from Indoor Space, and it's was, and it's for the uh, our client was the, the European Space Agency, and this is all contextualized inside what it is called the Copernicus project. Okay, the Copernicus project is probably, or well, I didn't say even probably, it is in fact the most ambitious Earth observation program to date. Okay. Um, it basically, it provides a timely, accurate, and easily accessible information to improve the management of, with three main objectives, to improve the, manage, the management of the environment, to provide civil security, and to reduce the effects of the climate change. Okay? So when where does Copernicus come from? It's the evolution of the, you have written it there, GMES, that means the global monitoring um, environment and social security system. The project is headed by the European Commission in a partnership with the European Space Agency. The European Commission, is uh, acting on behalf of the European Union, is responsible for the overall environment, uh, also for the setting the requirements and, manage and the management of the different services, whereas the European Space Agency is responsible not only for the, the development of the data and the providing the data, but also for the, the different uh, missions of satellites that are related with this project. So at the end, uh, Copernicus is an unified system uh, through which a lot of the data is going to be fed and into a range of uh, thematic information um, information services that are um, designed uh, for the benefit of the, 
of the environment and for our even our lives and we could re summary in just in a phrase saying that to help us in a more sustainable future and all of these services are grouped in six main categories that you have here in the in the slide the oceans earth atmosphere emergency security and climate change our project is one of the cases that is focused in the earth observation in this project the european space agency is using exploding more than 30 years of expertise they have in the in the space missions and how is copernicus possible well the european space agency has developed uh, has designed a particularly family of satellites for the purpose of the sentinel of the copernicus program that are the sentinels mission all these sentinel missions uh, share some things in common. For example, all of them are composed by our families or constellations of two different satellites uh, to fulfill the revisit and uh, recover and get a really um, robust data sets for the purposes of the Copernicus project. But every each Sentinel mission has a different kind of technology. Here we are only showing Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 because these have been the main sources we have used in our project, okay? But there are a total of six uh, Sentinel missions. Here you can see that Sentinel-1, for example, is the night radar imaging technology based, whereas Sentinel-2 is high resolution multispectral imaging mission. Okay, so, uh, so Sentinel-1 is more focused perhaps in weather and and land, and whereas Sentinel-2 more, and land cover, water cover, and so on, okay? Some of the other mm, Sentinel missions are focused in at the atmosphere, uh, pollution, others in the ocean surface, the, its color, and, for, and the temperature, and the surface temperature, okay? So, as you can imagine, all of this is going to provide a huge amount of data that you not only need to generate it and store it. You also have to process it and try to get uh, information that uh, has to be useful for the industry for a new way for people. So uh, within this context is where the Land Analytics Earth Observation Platform is born because it is able to answer to all of these requirements since the image is taken uh, from the satellite till a final product okay, is offered. Here uh, you have uh, we have taken here some uh, images from the from the Earth, uh, from the European Space Agency, uh, where because perhaps if one of you want to go deeper in the Sentinel missions or Copernicus project, uh, you can see here uh, that our platform is also related in this in this web page. Okay, so what, no, uh, what is our platform about? I have already said, but I'm going to go a little deeper. Okay, so the idea is we're going to capture the information from the satellite, we're going to process it, and as a result, we are we're going to have at a pixel level classification with the presence of water, not water. We are going to go a step further, as I have mentioned before, we are going to try to aggregate all these pixels in a water body. And even more, we are trying to just not get these water bodies, but try also to learn their behavior. And how are we going to try to learn this behavior? We have defined two different approaches. The first one is based only on the information coming from the images itself, themselves. Okay. So the idea is if I am able, and we have been able, of course, to identify a mass of water, we are going to have this, uh, well, my colleagues are uh, in the second part of the presentation is going to explain you how. Uh, we can have uh, all the uh, in different st steps of time of this water area. I'm going to know its area evolution, okay? With this, perhaps I can, I don't know, but perhaps we can try, try we can uh, train a model based on a time series model or even a deep learning model with recurrent neural networks, okay? So this is one of the approaches to learn the behavior, and the other one is try to enrich our data set, crossing it with external information. Coming, for example, uh, from the geological information, vegetation, and topographic information. With this, you can build a data set, and you can use, for example, the machine learning libraries from Spark, and try to, to train a machine learning model based on that. Okay. 
here's a summary of the information we have processed to, for the platform. We have images, all of them were square size with almost 11,000 rows and 11,000 columns. Every, each image has a total of uh, 120 million pixels. All the information uh, was concentrated in the geographical area of Catalonia. <coughs> we have processes, sorry, um, 244 images from a uh, in a period of time of from April and July 2017. If you do the math, you can easily arrive to see that we have processes more than well, more than 20 now, now 29,000 million pixels. Okay, here is a very very uh, concise. Uh, <laughs> Um, slide of the architecture of the platform. As I have said before, uh, it is divided in two different parts. The first one is what we call the processing subsystem. The is in charge of taking information or information coming from the satellite. <coughs> Sorry, and it, uh, at the end, at the result, we have a pixel uh, classified with water on or not water. This information, my colleagues are going to explain later how. Is ingested in our analytics subsystem with Sophia 2, and with the data flow model I have shown you before, and there all the analytic, uh, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, uh, takes place. So <coughs> almost because now I'm going to leave the ground to my colleague Sarah, who's going to tell you the methodology. Thank you, Santiago. Uh, now I'm going to explain uh, the, method the methodology uh, we employ to extract useful information from satellital images. Uh, just to be sure that all of us know how a satellite works, I'm going to tell you just a few things. Uh, a satellite uh, orbits around the Earth, taking different photos over time. Uh, these images, these photos, have associated two main parameters uh, called orbit and tilt. If two images have the same values of orbit and tilt, they present information of the same geographical area. So, you see? I think that with this information and with the information that Santiago told you before related to Sentinel, you are an expert on satellites, so we can talk about the uh, workflow of the project right now. I, the, the project was divided into two main steps. Here in the presentation, uh, we are going to focus on the second step of the project because, well, from our point of view, our super objective point of view, is the most interesting part of the project. And, well, we really work on this the step of the project. Uh, in the first step of the project, the, the, the satellite images were transformed into dispersion matrices, matrices with just one and zero values. Uh, where one uh, values present indicate the present of water. Okay. In the second step of the project, we receive these dispersion matrices and we transform them into tabular data. Over this tabular data, we perform different kind of a study uh, with the with a common goal: uh, extract a water body from these images and uh, um, uh, study their behavior uh, over time. We perform two different kinds of study at two different levels of precision. A more general and overall uh, level of study and a more specific study, a pixel level of study. Uh, I'm going to explain uh, these, two, these two studies in more detail. But uh, before that, I want uh, to remind you this slide Santiago introduced a few seconds ago. Uh, please remember Every time I'm going to talk a table, uh, an image, sorry, uh, remember that we are dealing with 120 million row table. So just keep in mind this, this is a big, big figure. Uh, what was the first uh, study the European Space Agency asked for? Uh, they wanted to know the quantity of water per geographical area and per moment of time. And they also wanted to know the temporal evolution of this quantity, how, how this, the quantity of water, of water varies over time. So here, for example, we have eight images related to the same geographical area. As you remember, same orbit and same tile. And well, we can see that uh, there was a strong increase of water between April and May. Uh, it's important to say that in this first analysis, uh, we didn't distinguish between different sources of water. 
I mean, we aggregate information uh, from river, uh, from lakes, from seas, ocean, whatever pixel with water we found. Uh, no matter how far they were between them, okay? Uh, the second kind of study we performed was a, a pixel level analysis, more specific analysis. Um, the European Space Agency uh, asked for computing uh, the persistence of the pixel. What does it mean, the persistence of the pixel? It's super easy. It's just uh, uh, quantifying how many times a pixel presented water and how many times a pixel didn't present water. So for example, here you can see that this pixel uh, presented water three over seven times. You see? I think that for now everything is easy to understand, so let's complicate it a little. Um, in the previous step, uh, we uh, study each pixel independently. But now, now we seek to group the pixel. We seek to cluster the pixel according to their position in resp with respect to other pixels in the images. Uh, and just to be sure that all of us understand the methodology we follow, here we have a, an example, a small example. Um, I'm going to put it right here. Uh, we have three different uh, images, okay? They're associated to the same geographical area in three different uh, moments of time. Um, if we, uh, here. If we uh, analyze the first image, we, then we identify three different water bodies, the green one, the blue one, and the pink one. Okay. If we analyze the second image, we identify also three water bodies, three independent water bodies. Um, but if we compare both images, uh, we realize that this one, the, the blue water body, on the first moment of time, now in the second moment of time, belongs to the green water body. So we can relabel this water body like this. If we analyze the third image, uh, we identify two independent masses of water, and if we compare these two images, as we did before, we realize that this water body, the orange-yellow water body, now, in the third moment of time, belongs to the pink water body. So we can relabel it like this. Cool. But we can go further. Focus on this pixel, the pixel number one. This pixel uh, doesn't exist in the third moment of time, but it exists in the second moment of time. And when it exists, it's uh, close to the pixel number two. And this pixel number two exists in the third moment of time. And this pixel number two belongs to the pink water body in the third moment of time. So we can be sure that any time the pixel number one appears, it's going to be close to the pixel number two, and it's going to belong to the pink water body. So we can add this pixel number one to the pink water body. If we focus now on this other pixel, we can check that we have exactly the same situation. The pixel number one doesn't appear in the third moment of time, but when it appears, it's close to the pixel number two. So we can add this pixel number one to the final green water body. So that's a general idea of the methodology we follow to level the pixel in the images. And what was the algorithm? Well, just before talking about the algorithm, I want to show you what was the final result of our analysis. Here we have an example of a, a final table. Uh, we have uh, one table like this uh, per each uh, geographical area. Uh, this uh, table presents as many rows as pixels with, with water we have identified over time, and as many columns uh, as uh, in moment of time we have analyzed. And um, furthermore, it presents an extra column with the final consolidated ID level of the pixel or the water body the pixel belongs to. Now, what was uh, the algorithm we, we used to, um, to we, what was the algorithm we implement, uh, we used to implement this methodology? We employed two different approaches, uh, DevScan clustering and graphs. First, I'm going to talk about the graphs. Um, uh, we built a graph per uh, each uh, image, per, per each satellite image. Uh, 
um, we identify each pixel of the image as a vertice of the of the graphs, and the Chebyshev distance between pixels were the edges of the graphs. Over these graphs, we extract the connected component, and each connected component correspond to an independent mass of water. Cool. And what was the second approach? Uh, we employed a Debescan clustering algorithm. It's a base density approach. The idea behind is, is, is you, um, you have a point that belongs to a cluster. That means that this point is going to be close to another point of the same cluster. In, in other words, uh, all the points that belong to a cluster are going to be reachable from one another. And this, this algorithm uh, receives two main uh, parameters, called epsilon and uh, mean points. Epsilon is the minimum distance between two points to be considered neighbors. And mean points is the minimum number of points to form a dense region. In our case, in our case of a study, we identify each cluster as an independent mass of water, obviously. Uh, we employ the Chebyshev measurement, and we establish one at epsilon distance. Uh, both methodologies, both approaches, the graphs and the Debescan algorithm, uh, return exactly the same result. However, the computing time of the Debescan algorithm were lower so in our final delivery, in our final delivery to the European Space Agency, we finally use uh, the DevScan clustering uh, algorithm. And now we have prepared a, a demo uh, in Sofia 2, well, now one side uh, platform. So uh, this demo, uh, let's see. This demo uh, has been, had been built using. Uh, oh, qué bien. Sorry. Y cómo para. Sorry, just a minute. <laughs> Um, okay, um, this demo has been built um, on one side, and we have used a um, JavaScript library called Flesium. Okay, uh, here we have a uh, water um, water reservoir in the north of Spain. Okay, the image you are seeing here is um, the image that is available in Google Earth. Okay, no, it's not any of the uh, images from Sentinel. Uh, we have simulated simulate five different uh, moments of time. Um, we can uh, we can check uh, one by one every moment of time. Uh, here, for example, uh, you can see that the water reservoir is quite empty. So we have identified four different water bodies. If we check the second image, we uh, Identify four water, four independent water bodies. Uh, we can check the next one, the third one. Here we have six different water bodies. As you can see, the water bodies have increased their sizes. The fourth moment of time, we have two water bodies, and finally we have a single water body. We can compare two different moments of time, for example, the third one and the fourth one, and you realize that uh, in the third moment of time, these one, two, three, four, five uh, masses of water, in the fifth moment of time, in the fourth moment of time, sorry, all of them belong to the same water body, the pink, gray, big water body. Uh, furthermore, you can check for the area of each uh, water body, like this, in square meters. 
So if we combine all the information for all the moment of times, uh, we realize that we have a single mass of water that has increased their size over time. So let's see, we can see here the temporal evolution. Here uh, we have that we have a single uh, water body that had increased over time. So here you can see the five moment of time uh, running. Okay, so now we're going to conclude the presentation. Santiago is here. It's going to uh, it's going to conclude the presentation, uh, tell you some achievement and the future application of the, our work. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. So just to end the presentation, um, these are the achievements that uh, in the final review were reported to the to the uh, to the European Space Agency, and it was um, the, the agency confirmed them. Finally, we have built a full industrial implementation of platform in a cloud environment that is based in uh, a combination. I, I want you to, to remember the, the slide I, we have presented before with the, with the architecture, with the F observation and processing subsystem connected to the analytical subsystem. And with this, we have finally been able to extract the time series information related to water bodies and identify uh, singular uh, water bodies. And of course, this has future applications. Uh, this methodology is, can be easily exported, just not to the Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 missions, but for any Sentinel mission, okay? Uh, you can not focus only in the detection of water, but also any uh, forest or vegetation cover or whatever. And also, you can cross this information with, uh, with external sources. When you can even uh, build a model to uh, easy or to anticipate, uh, for example, uh, fire forest and things like that. Okay. So I think that's all. Uh, uh, thank you for your assistance. And muchas gracias a todos por, por haber asistido. So uh, now in 25 theater, we have the key closing note. So thank you. If anyone has any question. Gracias. Okay, thank you. Gracias.